Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for uh, attending today. We'll, we'll make a, a start in a minute. Just wait for a couple more people to, to show up. But uh, thanks for uh, attending today to talk about protecting business information. If you can just um, check in the box, uh, just whether you can hear me okay. And uh, we will make a start. And I am recording this, so you will have access to the recording uh, in a few days. And uh, I will uh, make available the PowerPoint presentations. I'll send them to you uh, later on today as well. So let's make a start. Um, my name's David Ashton. Uh, welcome to Protecting Business Information. Uh, that's just a bit about me. Um, so I work uh, particularly in areas of uh, business management systems, so helping businesses get their uh, ISO certifications for things like quality management, health and safety environment, and also information security management, which is the basis of this discussion today, which we'll look at uh, how to implement, you know, from you as a business owner, a business manager, what sort of policies, procedures, and the like that you can put in place to manage your business information and protect that, and also protect your client information, your customer, your, um, your third party suppliers. Um, so that's the basis of today. I mean, the minute you introduce people into your business, whether they be employees, contractors, or whatever, there is the potential uh, for uh, uh, you know mismanagement of information. And the whole purpose of today is to give you some tips on how you can uh, improve that management and make sure that the negative impacts of that don't occur. So we'll. So that's, as I said, that's a bit about me. Uh, business Station uh, uh, provides a range of support services to small and medium businesses. So do take advantage of what they have to offer, uh, social media training, finance, IT, and the like, plus business incubators and, and various support networking events. So have a look at the Business Station website uh, to see what's available to you. And this program is funded by the Australian Small Business Advisory Service Digital Solutions Program, so funded by the federal government. And there's a range of uh, support services through Business Station that you can access, whether you be in WA, Queensland or Northern Territory. So <coughs> what we're going to talk about today, um, looking at you know, fraud and corruption in your business, so you know, theft of money and, and assets and, and equipment and the like, you know, look at, at privacy, so protecting personal information, so that of your clients, customers, uh, third party suppliers, and any other uh, parties that you deal with. Uh, the Essential Eight, it's a, I guess, probably more of an IT type uh, setup there that the government has uh, suggested uh, that small business uh, implement. You gotta look at business continuity, so what happens if. Uh, something goes wrong in your business, how do you guarantee the supply of your goods and services to the market? So, um, you know, for example, what happened, you know, in, in my case, uh, the internet goes down, uh, how do I continue uh, doing this uh, webinar? What sort of backup procedures do I have in place to ensure continuity of, of this webinar in the case of my internet crashing halfway through the, the session? So. And then we'll, we'll tie it all together with information security management systems. So that's the policies and procedures that you can put in place. And then I'll um, just go through some, just a, a slide, a couple of slides on what's um, just sort of legislation that, that's applicable to this, that you need to be across um, some standards and also what support is available out there to you. So, so that's pretty much uh, the session for today. So we'll look at um, preventing uh, fraud and corruption in your business, and you'll probably associate corruption with with um, you know, government, but you know it can happen 
in in your business as well. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is and how you can prevent these things. So fraud and corruption, intentional act involving the use of deception or deception to obtain an unjust or illegal advantage. So, um, you know, people, you know, stealing your, your money. Um, yeah, and there's examples of, of people, you know, you know, something, you know, through mismanagement of invoices, uh, the like, you know, taking 10% of your money and putting it in, into their bank account, that type of thing. Um, so misappropriation of assets, so using your, your equipment for personal use, um, manipulation of financial reporting. So, you know, if you put incorrect information on your tax return or, or whatever, that, that's an example of fraud. Uh, causing loss liability through deception. So, um, yeah, so, you know, incorrect invoicing um, and, and the like is an example of that. Uh, yeah, so false invoicing for goods and services, uh, backdating agreements, uh, fictitious accident, harassment or injury claims, misuse of leave entitlements. So there's examples of some fraud that... Uh, could be committed in your business or against your business, whether they be employees, contractors, or third-party suppliers. And then we've got um, you know, corruption, so dishonest behaviour by those in positions of power acting contrary to the interests of the business, so abuse of trust in order to gain personal gain for themselves or someone. So as I said, yeah, yeah you most commonly associate this with government but um you know it can happen in your business and depending on the size you have and if it's just you then that's that's a different matter but you know as i said the minute you bring other people into the business there's always a potential uh, for these things to happen so examples of corruption you know payment of secret commissions bribes and it could be you know someone in your business seeking to um you know, bribe government officials, say, in a tender process or something like that. So um, it, it does work both ways. And there's some pretty high profile cases in WA at the moment of these sort of things happening uh, with, with government. And procurement and the tender process is one area that is ripe for um, corruption and, and fraud. So be it be across that. Um, so using influence, blackmail, Failure to disclose gifts or hospitality. You know, if that's a, if you have a policy on on that, and your staff don't do that, then that's an example of corruption, misuse of internet or email. For, um, so it's all around, you know, you specifying your expectations as the business owner, and then any any evidence of acting contrary to that could fall within the realms of fraud and corruption, and you're entitled to you know call in the the police to to investigate that. And you can see here, these sort of things can have a negative consequence for your business, for your cash flow, um, your relationships with suppliers and clients. So there is a lot of uh, downside to these things happening, the reputational risk of the business. And, and also, you know, from a business development point of view, and, you know, I talk about this, you know, when I run my tender uh, webinars is that you, you need to be able to demonstrate that you're a safe pair of hands to a prospective uh, buyer of your goods and services. And you know, these are the sort of things that you may get questions about when you, you know, you, you're, you're su uh, submitting a bid for, for a tender or applying for a grant application. Um, so it's important to, to be across these issues and to have some policies and procedures in place. And you know, I'm not talking about <coughs> Sorry, I'm not talking about sort of voluminous documents. It could be, you know, a one-page flowchart that just outlines some of your uh, processes around this. Some of these things could be incorporated into supplier agreements, uh, employment agreements, contractor agreements and the like. So preventing it, so develop and implement some policies and procedures, you know, have a commitment to those identify risks to your business and de develop some risk management strategies around that. Um, yeah, look at your due diligence on prospective employees, contractors and suppliers. Um, so, you know, your recruitment and selection process, so communication and training, 
uh, for your employees and contractors on your expectations in relation to the implementation of these policies and procedures and constantly monitor and review them. So, you know, undertake some audits yourself or um, external audits and then, you know, have in place provision where you can enforce these and apply sanctions to that. So some of the policies that you might want to implement in your business, um, you know, as I said, particularly when you're engaging employees and contractors, you know, things like a code of conduct, uh, you know, rules around conflict of interest, uh, reporting fraud and corruption. So you want to encourage your staff to be alert to these sorts of things. Uh, personal file access, you know, not everyone needs to have access to your files and records. Uh, the recruitment selection and induction process, and that follows on to performance management and exit, um, leave, uh, flexible work arrangements. So, you know, we put increased emphasis on people working from home. What sort of protections are you going to put in place there for your, to, to ensure that your business uh, information and assets are protected? Uh, risk management, travel, use of corporate credit card, you know, rules around procurement and contracts management, you know, your financial management, all your internal controls, you know, separation of duties, things like that, confidentiality, discipline, and acceptable use of your computer. So, so as I said, they don't need to be voluminous documents, you know, simple one-page flowcharts or you know, dot points, you know, do this, do that type thing depending on the size of your business really but if you can demonstrate you know even in a, a contract of employment um <coughs> or a third-party contractor agreement if you can put some uh, clauses in there relating to these sort of matters then that's an adequate um you know protection you know for you uh, to ensure that people do that and obviously if they don't you know act in accordance with their contract then you have every right to terminate that and seek recourse against them. So that's, uh, you know, fraud and corruption and some, uh, you know, what it is and, you know, some simple ways that you can, uh, you know, protect yourself uh, from that. So this sort of leads also into privacy, um, the Privacy Act 1988, which is really dealing with, you know, personal information. So information about your customers, your suppliers, um, your employees, um, you know, and, and how you use that information. So really it's around the collection of it. You know, why do you collect it? How you collect it, how you store it, what you do with it, uh, how you dispose of it um, at, at the end of its useful life. So the Privacy Act is, you know, regulate how business collects, store, dispose, provide access to use and disclose personal information. So that's essentially what it is. And you need to have some uh, procedures around that. I mean, if you're allowing people to use credit card for purchases, then obviously you're co collecting credit card details about a person. You know, if you're getting people to go to your website and fill out a, a, a checkbox to receive a newsletter, then you're collecting personal information about that. So whilst if you're operating below $3 million turnover, um, there's no requirement for you to have uh, some policies, but it is, uh, you are encouraged to do that, particularly where you are dealing with personal information. Again, it just creates that credibility, that level of comfort that you're a credible business to, to deal with. So protecting personal information. So, you yeah, know, be very strong in your security of that, whether it be paper records or electronic records. So have in place policies around access to those records. Yeah, put in place a, a privacy plan. So as I said, you know, and, and take, you know, if we go back to the you know, earlier slide, you know, collect, store, you know, use those as headings, collect, you know, how do you collect it? Could be a paragraph, you know, we collect uh, information through these means, we store it using these means, uh, uh, we dispose of it at you know its end of its useful life, and this is how we dispose of it. Uh, who has access to it in your business? Um, how do you use the information? And you know, on what basis do you disclose that information to other parties? So you know, a simple one or two page a statement outlining that. 
So, and then you know, develop your plans, identify the types of information you collect, identify any applicable laws and regulations that, that pertain to that information. And then you know, determine how information is collected and processed, used, stored, accessed and disposed. And then you know, develop risk registers around how you're gonna manage any breaches of your privacy provisions. So, and then, you know, your solutions are based around, you know, your customer privacy, uh, looking at your legal compliance, you know, data protection. So that could be particular software that you use um, in making sure that you're not subject to cyber attacks. Um, and then, you know, early detection of breaches and the ability to identify any intruders with that. So again, simple policies and procedures around how you're gonna manage these sorts of things. And then, you know, looking at reporting misuse or breaches, um, you know, particularly in relation to employees, you know, their commencement and exit procedures. So uh, making sure, you know, when they come on board that they, you know, proper induction process around, you know, the expectations that you have in relation to management of these things. Um, contract and employment policies, procedures. And then when they exit, the organisation, some um, processes around that, you know, returning uh, corporate information, uh, cancelling passwords and the like. And also, um, you know, within the contract, you might uh, have provisions in there around uh, protection of confidential information, you know, not only when they're working for you, but when, um, when they uh, leave the organisation as well. And, you know, conduct uh, regular audits of your, your policies and procedures to make sure that they're actually happening. And if you go to this website here, Australian Office of, Office of Australian Information Commissioner, uh, there's some uh, tools and templates and resources that you can use to help you uh, develop these uh, procedures and, and policies and just a bit of better understanding as to what uh, privacy is all about. If you have any questions as we go, just drop them in the chat box. Um, I may get to the answers, but I'm happy to uh, um, answer those. And, and I will um, hang around for another five or so minutes after the presentation, if you've got any questions that you want to ask. So one of the things that uh, the, uh, the cyber Security Centre of the Federal Government is uh, as suggested is this uh, for um, small and medium businesses is what they call the essential eight, um, which are simply some strategies, simple strategies that you as a small business owner can implement um, to protect your ICT systems against cyber security threats. So it looks at things like malware, delivery and execution, cyber security incidents and recovery of data and also system availability. And that's the website that you can go to, to find um, uh, information about that. Uh, as I said, I will send this um, presentation to you so you'll have those uh, websites available. But the essential aid, as I said, it's sort of dealing with the software and the, the ITC, ICT system itself. So, you know, it's targeting, um, you know, intrusion aimed at stealing data, it's looking at ransomware, um, you know, external advocacies who destroy data and prevent computer networks from functioning, malicious insiders who steal data such as customer details or intellectual property. So that's, you know, employees, contractors and the like. Um, and, you know, looking at, um, damage to your computer files and your networks as well. So there's just some simple things that you could, that they recommend you put in place. So application whitelisting, so that's um, you know, allowing identified entities access to components of the system. So the opposite of blacklisting, obviously blacklisting is things that can't happen. Whitelisting is things that can happen. Uh, patch applications, um, you know, designed to update, fix or improve the system, looking at configuring Microsoft Office macro settings. Um, so some you know, procedures around that. 
application hardening. So, you know, removing non-essential software and programs from your system, web browsers, making sure that they're configured to prevent pop-ups and looking at uh, Microsoft Office configurations around flash content and object linking and the like. So, again, something that you would work with your IT people to help you set up some, uh, you know, procedures around or some, you know, access uh, around these sorts of things. So administrative privileges, so who has access to your systems and your files. Um, not everyone in your organisation needs to have access to everything to do with your business. So you go be mindful as to who should have those. The patch operating system, so use the latest operating system version, don't use unsupported multi-factor authentication. So, you know, two, two passwords or two, two means of accessing, so a password and a security key or, or tokens or, you know, even smart cards when you're accessing buildings, for example, and, you know, having regular backups as well. I got caught the other week thinking that my... Um, <clears throat> Some information was backed up on my OneDrive, but it apparently lost it. So I lost a couple of days of information. I was able to get it back, but it was a bit annoying at the time. Um, so just be mindful that, uh, you know, you've got your backups not only on your computer, but perhaps a separate portable hard drive and online uh, through the cloud as well. So there's something that you just might want to work with your IT um, people just to make sure that you've got proper um, you know, system control in place around these essential eight suggestions of the government. So the other thing too is looking at things like business continuity as well. And th this is really important in terms of being able to deliver your goods and services to the market that you do have strategies in place to deal with when things go wrong. As I said, what happens if the internet goes down um, for yourself? You know, what backup measures do you have in place to ensure continuity, particularly if you're looking for people to book uh, online or purchase online? Uh, you don't want to lose uh, customers if they can't get access to your system and the frustrations that go with that. So business continuity is really management process to identify threats to your organisation and the impact to business operations. So as I said earlier, you know, if the, the internet was to go down here where I am and, you know, I couldn't continue delivery of this presentation, then obviously that impacts my ability to deliver the service to you and you miss out on the webinar. So what backup measures do I have? You know, can I use my mobile phone and connect it up through my hotspot? Um, that, that type of thing. So. Um, they, these are the sort of really identifying what is the risk to your business and then putting in place a strategy to, to manage that risk and, and prevent it from impacting your business uh, negatively. So, you know, building organisational resilience, diminish and avoid disruption, minimise risk and volume and vulnerability and ensure timely resumption of operations. And that last dot point there is important that, you know, if something does go wrong, that you're able to get up and running as quickly as possible. Maybe not in the exact form that you would normally do so, but so long as there is some mechanism to allow you to continue to trade or operate. And to put in place a, a business continuity plan, there is a template there in the website that um, you can access to help you work through some uh, procedures around business continuity. So, you know, in developing your plan, you know, looking at your risks and impacts, developing business strategy, you know, the treatment plans, implement the plan, test it and review and maintain it. So, um, as a, like everything, it's all about scale, depending on the size of your business. Could be a, simple, you know, identify a number of risks to your business and develop some simple flow charts to say, okay, well, if this happens, we're going to do this, that, and the other. If that happens, we're going to do this, that, and the other. That, that's all it needs to be. So long as you've got something, and particularly, as I said, in the case of if you've got employees or contractors and, and you're not in the office that day, then at least there's some, uh, you know, there's a, an understanding as to what needs to happen 
um, in your absence. So yeah, so outline the risks. So in, in, in the plan itself, outline the risks and then go through and develop your, um, your treatment plans for those. So you know, I'd, you know, perhaps rank the risks from highest to, to lowest or in terms of the con consequence to your business, uh, description of the threats, um, you know, the conditions for activating the plan and, and then any emergency procedures which you might put in place. Fallback procedures, so as I said, using my mobile phone and hotspot instead of the uh, internet connection. You know, look at storing your backups off site or in the cloud, a combination of both. Procedures to return to normal business, regular maintenance and, of the plan and testing. Awareness and education, so employee inductions and regular staff meetings, looking at roles and responsibilities. I mean, it could just be you doing everything, but you know, if you've got other people working for you, you might allocate some responsibilities to them. So that's um, so business continuity, very important, important from business development. Um, you know, I do a lot of work in the tender space, and more often than not, you get questions about your business continuity because um, you know, government and, and industry want to be satisfied that no matter what the circumstances, you can deliver to them what they want when they want it. So it's important that you have things like backup procedures, uh, plant and equipment, you know, regular maintenance, preventative maintenance, backup equipment in case something breaks down. Um, you know, so that you can satisfy your prospective client uh, and your current clients that no matter what the circumstances, you're still going to be in a position to deliver the goods and services to them. So tying all these things together is a standard called information security management systems. It's one of the um, ISO international standards, which you can get a certification for. And it really is focused on, you know, the development of policies and procedures um, to manage information security risks. So again, going through that process of identifying what are all the security risks that you have in your organization and then developing some policies and procedures around how you're going to manage those risks. So and it you know, it's, it's very much risk management. Um, but from my point of view also it's business development because again it's it's giving comfort to prospective supplier uh, clients that that you have solid policies and procedures in place to manage your risks. And again, no matter what the circumstance, you can deliver your goods and services to them. And, you know, it, it can help businesses at all levels. And as I said, depending on the size of your business would depend on the extent to which you need to implement these sort of things. So, you know, the purpose of the system is for you to examine your, your security risks, develop policies and procedures to manage that and adopt uh, processes to ensure controls continue to meet your security needs. So they need to grow as your organisation grows. So the standard is split up into 10 sections. So the first three are really just introductory statements. You can purchase uh, these uh, standards um, through Standards Australia, SAI Global is the main a body dealing with these. And then the uh, sections four to 10 are the actual requirements. So these are the things that you must do to develop a information security management system that's consistent with this standard. And it's an in international standard. So, um, you know, you may get questions in a tender, you know, do you have a information security management system consistent with the standard? And if you do, you can tick that off and, um, that uh, you know helps you uh, could help you win a tender. So the requirements you know, determine the organisational context. So that is looking at internal and external factors that impact your business. So external could be the market, uh, the environment in which you operate, um, the size of the market, and the like. Internal issues are things like um, you know your number of employees, uh, your location the size of your business, um, you know, the type of ICT you use, 
So it's looking at both external and internal factors that uh, impact the operation of your business. Um, from There may, needs to be leadership, so top management, so that's you as the business owner, and managers need to be committed to this process and demonstrate that. Um, you need to develop plans to ensure that uh, your, your security system can achieve its outcome. So you need to set the policies and procedures and the objectives and then make sure you put in place the plans to ensure that they are realised and the risks are mitigated and also improve business performance as well. You need to determine the resources required to support it. So it could be people, it could be uh, software, it could be particular hardware that you might need. So this is all determined through that planning process. So, and then plan, implement, control, and maintain the process is needed to develop, implement, and maintain an ISMS. So, so that's your policies and procedures. Um, again, depending on the size of your business will determine the, the amount of uh, documentation and procedures that you need to develop. You need to regularly review the performance of your system. So. And, you know, particularly if there are incidences that happen, you need to get an understanding as to why it happened and put in place measures to make sure it doesn't happen again. But, you know, just regular reviews of your ICT and the procedures and the performance of your staff and contractors to make sure that they're complying with the, the documentation that you put in place. And, you know, report, investigate and take action to determine and manage non-conformities and improve performance. So a non-conformity is... You know, when something does happen that's contrary to your procedures, you need to understand why it happened and what uh, you know, need to understand why it happened and um, you know what you need to do to correct it and what you need to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. And it's all about continuous improvement as well. So you're you know, as your business grows, you're reviewing your procedures, you're putting in place new procedures, and you're constantly improving the performance of your organisation. And these are, the, you know, these are the things that if you bring in an auditor to assess your system, that they're going to look at. They're going to look at your, your documentation, so your policies and procedures, and then they're going to look at evidence of implementation of those. So good record keeping document control is critical to this as well. So you need to have a policy. So a policy is really a statement of intent. Um, you know, this is what we hope to achieve by developing this uh, management system so it needs to be appropriate to the context and strategic direction of your organization it has to set the framework for the management system um, it has to have a commitment to satisfying applicable requirements uh, which we'll talk about and continuous improvement and legislative compliance and you've got to document it communicate and make it available so you know these are the sort of things that you would including your induction pack for new employees and contractors. Uh, you might put a copy of it on your website. Um, uh, often in larger organisations that have a you know, front counter, you might see it on the wall there. So as long as it's communicated to people that need to see it. You also need to set objectives. So what do you want to achieve this? Obviously, you know, minimise the lost time due to um, you know, IT failure, for example. You know, it's got to be consistent with the policy. You've got to be able to measure it. It's got to be applicable to your organisation. You've got to monitor it, communicate it, and update it as required. So you know, every year, you know, when you're planning, doing your business plan for that year, maybe just put some objectives in for what you want to see achieved with your, your ICT and your information security management and then procedures. Um, yeah, they're the doing, this is how we're gonna do things. This is how we're gonna run the business. And I think importantly, you know, these procedures are not seen as this thing over here that you've got to comply with, but it's actually the way you do business. So it gets down to your induction and communication to your employers. This is the way that we do business around here. Compliance will just be a natural consequence of that. So the system does require you to have um, certain documentation. So you're going to develop the scope of it. So is it going to apply across the whole business or only a part of it? You've got to have a policy. Uh, you've got to have a document outlining the objectives. Um, 
You've got to put in place a risk assessment plan and risk treatment plan, um, statement of applicability, which will go through. So they're looking at the various internal controls that you put in place. Uh, risk assessment report, definition of security roles and responsibilities in your organisation. So if you've got job descriptions, for example, or a contract of employment, you might just put in there a section on what their uh, the employee or even contractors roles and responsibilities are in relation to ICT, information security, develop an inventory of your assets, um, a policy around acceptable use of those assets and policies and procedures around access control. So who in your organisation should have access to what, uh, whether it be files, whether it be use of assets and the like, and not everyone needs to have access to everything. And then the risk treatment plan. So identify your risks, look at the likelihood and consequence of those, give it a risk rating, and then put in place uh, some risk treatment plans to mitigate the negative consequences of those risks. And then Annex A is the reference control objectives, statements of applicability. Um, so these are all the control measures that, and objectives that you can put in place. And we've got those there. So there's 14 of them. So security policies, information security, HR security, asset management, access control, cryptography, physical environment, security operations. And you see their business continuity is an important element of that as well. So these next few slides just go into uh, what you need to do. So information security, the organization. So that's how you actually go about implementing it. Also looking at mobile devices and teleworking. So you know, with the increase uh, home, working from home, your working for home procedures need to have some reference to how you manage information security, HR. So looking at things like um, recruitment, selection, induction, performance management, termination and change of employment, that'll have an impact on the level of access that a person should need. Asset management, as we mentioned, so whose responsibility for it, um, information classification, media handling, and obviously some, a, list, a list of all your assets. Access control, so who, is, who can have access to what within your organisation. Cryptography, so how you're going to protect confidential information and the integrity of that. And then physical environment security, so secure areas and equipment, now using swipe cards, that sort of thing to access certain parts of your building, operational security. So this is uh, sort of linked a bit to the essential eight, uh, would help you implement some operational security measures around backups and passwords and, and the like. Communication security. So looking at information transfer, making sure you've got some protection in place for that. System acquisition, development, maintenance, and so looking at um, the type of equipment that you're going to buy and make sure that that's adequately secure and it has the capacity to secure your information. Supplier relationships, so incorporating you know, information security into your uh, contractor agreements, your third party supplier agreements. So looking at incident management, how you're going to manage any incidents that occur, your business continuity, and then you know, develop a register of legal and other requirements that you have to comply with and develop strategies to um, ensure that you're complying with those. So that's really the control measures that you need to put in place uh, for your business. And then if we look at, um, you know, the legislation, so the Privacy Act, which we touched on, State Records Act, so federal and Commonwealth, uh, sorry, federal, state and local government comply with the Records Act around record keeping and document control, archiving and access to those. So you might get, uh, you know, if you're doing work with government, you need to be across um, their requirements in relation to record keeping. Likewise, with freedom of information, 
uh, the contract that you have with the government and your operations with the government may be subject to FOI. If you're dealing with um, businesses in Europe and customers in Europe, then you need to be across the data protection regulation, which is similar to our Privacy Act. Applicable standards, uh, good governance around fraud and corruption, um, codes of conduct and the like, and then the information security management system. So um, that's the one that we've just gone through. So, And then government support. Uh, I've given you a couple of websites and templates throughout the presentation, but in particular, the Australian Cyber Security Centre has uh, some useful advice and support and information that are available for small, medium businesses. And the Oz Cyber uh, Centre is... Um, has been set up to, I guess, promote cyber security uh, throughout the country amongst businesses. So have a look at their website as well. Uh, so that's um, the presentation for today. Um, in summary, I think it's successfully implemented. IMS will have, uh, ISMS will have um, you know, management commitment from yourself as the owner, commitment from all levels of the organisation, adequate communication, effective policies, procedures in place, resources allocated to it, the implementation of it, integration with other business processes, there'll be you know, monitoring and measuring of performance. And importantly, you'll have documented evidence of implementation. And I think that'll lead to secure business information, reduced IT uh, information security costs, um, You'll be able to respond to evolving security threats. There'll be confidentially of data, you know, yours as the business and your customers. Increased resilience, fulfillment of compliance obligations, business integrity and business growth, which are linked. So I do believe that, you know, as I said, my involvement with tenders and grants and the like, there's increasing focus on um, um, cyber security and information security management. I was helping a a client last week with um, a tender and they had quite a comprehensive questionnaire that they had to complete on their information security management. So, you know, and one of the, some of those questions are around what sort of policies and procedures they had in place. And likewise with tenders, you may get a question around how you manage um, business information and, and particularly the client's information. So be mindful of that. And if you can demonstrate some policies and procedures and record of activity in this area, then that will stand you in good stead um, in convincing a client, whether it be through a tender or other means, that you're a safe pair of hands. Um, so thanks for participating today. They're my contact details. I will send you a copy of the presentation a bit later on. And um, if you want to have a follow-up discussion with me about this matter, feel free to give me a call. Um, so best of luck with that and um, yeah, certainly take advantage of any other uh, business station uh, services and support that we can provide. So thank you for your attendance.